I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. He said to me, he said, I'm dying. I said, mate, you're not dying. You're not, you're not dying. He goes, I'm dying. Monday Nabel is a critically acclaimed actor, writer and the voice of Fox Sports and he happens to be a mate of mine too. But this isn't a story about Matt. This is a story about his youngest brother, Aaron. He has a thing called uh, onset bulbar motor neurons disease. He's 43 years of age. He has uh, three children, three young boys, nine, two and one. And having this happen, given me perspective on what's important. There needs to be more effort in finding a cure. You know, there's some trials going on that Aaron will participate in. They're a fair way away to finding out how we can stop this. I sat with my mother and my father in the neurologist who mm. diagnosed my mother motor neuron disease yeah. with ALS. And I have to tell you, mate, that was the best part because it got progressively worse. pretty tough. They're little, little boys. And whatever we can raise, um, we'll, we'll ensure that those boys have the same opportunities to education that they would have had had Aaron been with them. Mate and Abel, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Yeah, great and to be here, Mark. Good to see you, mate. We've known each other for a long time and uh, we're going to talk about something really important. Uh, but you, I have to tell you, mate, you look a bit cooked. Yeah, look, it's been a – look, I've been on uh, uh, three jobs at the moment, so, I mean, that's sort of um, – What are you working on now? Uh, doing Last King of the Cross. Yeah. Uh, so I've been on that since April. That's a story about Ibram. Johnny yeah, Ibram. about Johnny, yeah, uh, who I've known for a long time. So I've been part of this one for – since about 2017, so – uh, what, what's your part? Can you say what your part is? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm playing um, a gangster. It, well, he's a he's a confidant of of Tim Roth's character, who's who's playing a guy called Ezra, who's you know a, an amalgamation of all these guys, the Louis Bayers, the Abe Saffrons, who sort of started in the cross, uh, who ran the cross, uh, and so I'm his right hand man type of thing. John's um, right hand man. No. no, no, Tim Roth, the guy, uh, Ezra Shipman, who right. Tim Roth plays. Yep. Um, so we had to, did a lot of shooting early on because Tim was here and we had to shoot him out. Uh, and then I've been going back and forth since. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff with uh, Lincoln Younes, who's playing Johnny, and uh, Claude, who's playing Sam Ibrahim. So, um, look, it's been been a long one. Uh, I also wrote one of the episodes. I, I got in, involved in that originally with, with Fenno and Johnny in 2017 and wrote the original pilot. I got busy doing other things, it sort of swapped around. So um, end up writing, I think I've written episode six on this one as well. So yeah, nearly finished that mate. Another thing down in uh, Tasmania, down the Bay of Fires on the West Coast there with um, Marta Dusseldorp doing a thing called Bay of Fires. And I just started another thing with Johnny Edwards called um, Year Of, which is a bit of a spin off of this thing they've got with Stan called Bump. So, you know, and then I've got a film come off to Perth on Thursday for Cinefest with a film I directed with Worthy, Sam Worthington, that comes out. So, yeah, mate, I'm tired. I'm, I'm, and and the stuff going on back at home is is yeah, it's been draining and uh, all consuming. But honestly, working at the moment's been a, a nice type of distraction. It's it's a blessing in some respects. It's it funny, is. you know, you said something about Abe Saffron. But when I was um, twenty nine. Uh, the law firm I was at, we actually represented him in his case um, uh, where he actually went to jail. We lost the case. but uh, <laughs> And uh, I met – I knew him quite well. I mm. got to know him quite well because I was doing that particular case. And yeah. um, I met his daughter and I took his daughter for years. Yeah, wow. Well, okay. Yeah, M- Melissa uh, yeah, okay. Hagenfeld. Um, yeah. And uh, I sort of got to know a little bit, of, a little bit about his life because – I yep. was dating his daughter. Yeah. And uh, I got to know him more in a private sense as opposed to what you read in the newspapers. And it was, yeah. um, and, and it was, then he went to jail after that. And then uh, yeah. I really lost contact with him after then. He died a little bit later. But it was, uh, it was interesting because he was a very polite, mm. never swore, mm. never, I never saw him raise his voice or get angry. Yep. Um, and I'm sure he had plenty, you know, he was going to go to jail. And, uh, yep. and, and not only that, he'd been given up by, Mm. His confidant, um, yeah. um, Jimmy, um, whatever his name is, Scotsman bloke up there, yeah. and uh, but he, he never he never seemed to be bothered. Um, very cordial, very mm. gentle. Yep, it was just like an amazing sort of experience. And uh, you're doing the, the, mm. you know the series with John Ibrahim yep. about John Ibrahim now, and uh, again, he's I mean I've got mm. to meet him, and he's mm. uh, quite a he's fairly quiet and uh, 
Yeah, look, it's, it's it, look, those guys. It's interesting, eh? Very interesting. I mean, when you're talking about Abe Saffron there, it's probably harking back to a time where, uh, you know, the gangsters were were much more polite. You know, there's all sorts oh, of stuff. Oh, dressed beautifully. Yep, yeah. There's all sorts of going on in Sydney at the moment, which is obviously gang-related and it's brutal and it's, um, you know, it's shocking. Uh, back then, those days, things were, there was a, a kind of, Elegance about what was going on um, with those guys. Um, so more respectful or something. Yeah, look, I think that was back then. I, I think there was the only thing you had to fear about or about gangsters was if you're involved with them. Yeah. At the moment, it all seems a little bit random and yeah, it's a, a little terrifying. But these guys ran the business the way they ran it, uh, and I've got to know John really, really well over the last few years. And one thing that sort of gets me about or strike, st- struck me straight away with him is the uh, charisma that, that, that that guy sort of exudes. And I think that, um, you know, that that's not a very, very common thing. And I think when you're a leader of men, particularly in that sphere, and I don't pretend to know, you know, what that world was like other than what I've read and what he's shared, uh, you know, that charisma and that confidence, um, albeit being in a very, very controlled and polite way, um, goes a long way. I mean, as soon as I met him, I was like, I, I understand. I get it. I, I understand why you've commanded the respect and uh, adulation of, of the people that um, uh, have worked for you and also how you've gotten to where you have gotten to. Um, yeah, there's a an innate thing, I think, Mark, that, that, that those types of guys are born with. Now, if John hadn't been operating in that world, then he would have been an immense success somewhere else by virtue of the fact that he has that innate confidence and, and charisma. He What is that charisma though? I mean, because you, you have to act out these roles. I mean, mm. you have to study these individuals. Not mm. You're not acting his role, yeah. but nonetheless, you're studying people and yeah. that's what you do. Yeah. And then you and you can recreate that. What do you think it is? Is it charisma, charm? What, what is it? Uh, look, I think it's a, uh, uh, like a confluence of things that sort of come together for one person. I think you know, there's part that is innate, you know, that's intrinsic that they're born with. And then I think whatever journey they've had to where um, they get to as a leader or people talk about actors and charisma as well. That's, you know, I think, again, that's something that you can recognise immediately with some some people. Um, And I'm not sure that they understand why they have it. They just have the ability to light up a room to make people laugh. Um, to make people feel good about themselves um, and they other people want to be in their company. So I think there's some of it can be learned. I think there's certainly an art and a craft to it. Um, but I think a lot of it is just what people are born with. Um, and when you recognise it, it's uh, very, very obvious. In the same breath, there are, there are people who are confidence people, confident con men, and I remember meeting one guy who um, they did a podcast about and I worked for him for uh, a year or so and got to know him. His name's Hamish Watson. So he's in jail now. But that guy um, ha- had a charisma and confidence that was – that got people who should have known, you know, a lot better um, and were – savvy business people or reportedly savvy business people that handed money hand over fist. I remember him. Yeah, and and he got people to do that. And I remember seeing him one day, he was on a boat, he just bought this Sunseeker boat and I remember looking at him and I was only 27 or 28 at the time and being really impressed in saying that I also knew that he was lying about certain things. I didn't have any idea about financially what he was doing. But he would tell fibs, and I would like that's that's not that's that's a lie. I mean, that's a lie. But he still, I mean, that's the ability of people with, with that sort of innate ability is to get people to believe in them when they know they're being told lies. Being persuasive, persuasive, and and giving them a sense of comfort, comfort that everything's going to be okay. And 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 for a lot of these people, he was he was able to. Uh, they'd come to him concerned about their money and walk away five minutes later thinking that that was fine and they're making more money. Yeah. You know, so that – but that was a similar type of confidence and charisma that that guy had. 
Um, and, I'm, and I've only identified it a couple of times in people, but John Ibrahim is certainly one of those guys. And he's not like that, but he's... He has an enduring charisma, an enduring competence. He does, yeah. It, it's sort of not bullshit. There's none. There, yeah. there, there really isn't, you know, like it's very above board and this is what you see is what you get. Um, but in, in saying that, it's it's very endearing. So, you know, I, I enjoy being in his company. I enjoy watching, you know, as a writer, I love watching you know, the interactions between people and, and seeing other people in his company, um, you know, is a really good lesson in in what that sort of confidence uh, can provide other people. It's 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 fascinating. Matt, you've, you know, I've watched you many, many years. I mean, you've played rugby league. Um, you've, you're, you were a fighter for a while. Mm-hmm. You're uh, an actor and a, and a well-known actor. You're a writer. You mm-hmm. direct. Um, all of these things are really pretty challenging. Um you know, they have the challenges, but you just got knocked for six, haven't you? Yeah, we have. I mean, when you, you know, you go through those things that you just said, you know, I don't really, I guess I've had a very, very diverse sort of life in that regard. Um, you don't really think about it too much when you're just sort of going from day to day. But yeah, the last, uh, in the last month, my younger brother who, um, there's five of us, uh, he's the youngest uh, he's been diagnosed with uh, motor neurons disease. He has a thing called uh, onset uh, bulbar motor neurons disease, um, which is a, a really difficult uh, situation to find himself in as a young man. He's 43 years of age. He has uh, three children, three young boys, nine, two and one. There, there's four different types of motor neuron disease that sort of falls under this ALS banner um, or ALS falling under motor neuron disease and the one that he has got, you know, the life expectancy isn't, isn't long, you know, it's sort of six months to three years from the moment you start exhibiting, um, symptoms and, and so for him it's, and for us, it's, it's just sort of taken us all, hit us for six and, and I was aware of motor neurons disease. My, my sister was a carer for a friend of hers who had it and, and passed away. Uh, and the cruel nature of it is it it just little by little takes everything from them. So he's struggling to speak. Uh, he's, um, you know, the, that's where it sort of starts first in this type of MND and uh, eventually it'll take his ability to walk and to, to look after himself. I was going to remember Aaron was a fairly handy boxer. Uh, Aaron and everyone in uh, back in, you know, I'm not talking hyperbolically here, he was as good as amateur as we've ever yeah, had. I remember. Um, Johnny Lewis will attest to that. Yeah. Um, uh, all the guys he was fighting with at that time. Well, I mean, Garthwood and Nandy, they always mm. wrap him as a good, like a real good fighter. Yeah, he was, you know, he was a national champion at a very early age. And, and Johnny Lewis, you know, Johnny's very, very close with us. And, um, you know, he was devastated by this news. And Aaron was sending me, sent a text message that Johnny had sent. And, and Johnny had said, you know, like what you achieved in that early period of boxing hadn't been done here, not here. Mm. The, the way uh, he was handling himself against Costa Zoo, against Justin Russell, he was he was exceptional, yeah. Um, gave it away relatively early, Mark, and um, never turned pro, so he stayed as an amateur. But, yeah, one of the – yeah, he was he was exceptional. And uh, so he always stayed fit and, and healthy. So and that's the – Not a big drinker? Oh no, he said he had his problems with with that. He he um he's been sober now for I think three years, but he certainly went down that path of um you know he didn't, he didn't really look after himself that well. But um you know that there's there's a lot of evidence to suggest that a lot of those things may be associated with head trauma and having too many hits. And you know there's a lot of research now into um, how addiction and mental health issues can take hold after people have endured, uh, you know, particularly in combat sports or rugby league, too many hits. So to what degree, we don't know. Um, but, and the sad thing is he's, he got through that and he's, a he's always just been a, a, a beautiful young man. He's a, a gentle, kind soul. And, um, you know, he's got his three boys at the moment that, that he adores and, um, and that, and that's very difficult for him at the moment. I think, more than anything, which is hard for us to watch, is the fear that he has. 
um, and he's frightened because of he knows how this ends up. It's uh, unlike, and there's some cruel diseases. I mean, obviously, cancer is a, a very cruel disease, but within cancer, then there's treatments and there's always an opportunity uh, or, or a hope that you can be cured. Um, unfortunately, with this, they're not at that stage yet. So, people who develop it um, will, will pass away. So, can I ask you a question, Manny? Mm. If you cast your mind back, say, how long ago was he diagnosed or how long ago did you find out about it? Uh, we found out about it about uh, five weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. So if you cast your mind back, say, let's say four months, four or five months, yeah. did you notice anything different in yeah, our did. Um he, His speech was um, getting progressively quite bad. It sounded like he's drunk. Yeah. Really or had been drinking. Yeah, like really or, you know, taken some sort of narcotic or yeah, um, yeah. then we knew that wasn't happening, but he'd also had some lazy speech uh, before that that was, you know, probably all it was, it was from, from boxing, you know. So a lot of guys walked out of those gyms and had similar problems. Mm. So I always thought, and that was the thinking going on in our family, that was probably just the progression of, of that. Mm. Um, but he knew, uh, I remember being in Crescent Head, um, it would have been six weeks ago now, seven weeks ago, with my oldest boy. He had an 18th with his friends up there and I went along with him and my sister rang me and said, look, Aaron's distressed. He's um, he, he's really upset. And I got on the phone with him and, and the speech was – he was crying so the, the speech was in, impeded. But um, he said to me, he said, I'm dying. And I said, mate, you're not dying. You're not, you're not dying. He goes, I'm dying. This is before he got the diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. He said, um, "There's something wrong here. I'm, I'm dying." Um, and then uh, would have been a week later. He was. He went to the neurologist again and was diagnosed. And 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 it, look, he didn't know what it was. We didn't. But look, I was ignorant of in motor neuron disease, and that's why there needs to be an immense amount of awareness and light brought to to it because uh, you, you know it's it's one of the most insipid diseases that we have. Um, incurable and, too. Incurable and, we, and there, there is a cure out there somewhere. Um, and so for Aaron, it, it was, he, like I said, he knew something was wrong but to have that confirmed was uh, was debilitating more for us than perhaps him because I think he, he, he could see something on the horizon that wasn't right. Um, but for us it was... Uh, yeah, just floored everyone, um, his family, his friends. Um, obviously, his, his children at an age where they can't comprehend what's going on. Um, and his uh, partner, yeah, it's uh, incredibly, um, yeah, it, it's life-altering in, in a sense that, you know, I think, you know, the older you get, Mark, the, the probability of, of things happening, those around you, are, you know, that gets, you know, window gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But uh, it, when it happened, we just, you're not prepared for it. So, um, you know, look, all we'll do, mate, is give him things to look forward to. Um, we're going to Vegas. Uh, and the doctor who he's, he's seeing is a guy called Dominic Rowe, who's roll, right at the coal face of this, who's a, who's a legitimate hero and, and, which uh, hospital university is it? Macquarie or Macquarie? At, yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're, they're a leader in um, yeah. ALS. Yep. Um, so he's yeah. been fantastic, and we went in there, and we're all there together when we went for the. He had a diagnosis, and then this was to uh, confirm the diagnosis, and he was there, and he said, "You know, look, I said well, I'm thinking about taking. We're all going to go to Vegas," and he said, "Go," he said, "Go, yeah, do whatever you can, Aaron. Don't go back to work." Maddie, mm. three years ago. Mm. In July, three yep. years ago, I sat with my mother and my father in the neurologist who mm. diagnosed my mother with motor disease yeah. with ALS. Yeah. And um, I remember um, maybe a month before ringing my mum. Mum didn't mm. drink. She was Irish. She mm. didn't drink. <laughs> Which was a funny, yeah. funny yeah. situation. Yeah. But uh, I said, um, Mum, you sound like you've been drinking. Mm. I said, maybe you're having a little whiskey with Dad. Mm. She said, no, no, love. But I, it sounded like she was not drunk. Yeah. Like, she tried to think it was something else. Mm. Like, it kept saying it's this, that. So we mm. got her diagnosed and uh, i never forget being in that room down here at St Vincent's mm. when the neurologist uh, said, it's motor neuron disease. Mm. 
And I tell you, mate, that was the best part because it mm. got progressively worse. pretty tough. Yeah. It's pretty tough. I went and saw my mother every single Saturday till mm. the day she died. Yep. For about, it took about six months. Mm -hmm. Her first question was to the neurologist, mm. how long do I have? Mm -hmm. And her second question is, can it be passed on mm. to my grandkids? Yep. That's what she wanted to know. And the answer to that is, uh, you know, six to 12 months, like you just said. Yep. And uh, the answer is yes, it can be yep. passed on. It's a pretty tough disease. I mean, I don't know. I, I agree. Most people don't have an mm. awareness of it. Like she, on the day she died, she mm. died of pneumonia in the end because mm. it doesn't kill you, it just stops you from doing anything. Exactly. But we had to put her into a hospital, into palliative care for the last week when mm. she had pneumonia. She refused to go to the hospital until right yep. to the end. And, uh, but she knew everything that was going on, mm. but she couldn't do anything about it. No, she couldn't that's... speak. She couldn't mm -hmm. write anymore. I've still got at home bits of paper mm. where mum, she couldn't talk anymore. And by the mm. way, Jara says she could, she loved talking. Okay. Yeah. She wouldn't shut up. Um, and uh, she started, she used to write stuff for me. She say, you know, how's something or other, how's mm. the grand, you know, how's our grandson, whatever that type of stuff, my yep. grandson. Um, and she'd write it out and I'd, I'd say oh, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And then over time the writing becomes scribble and I could see and you'll mm. see this but yeah. in time I could see the, the fear yeah. that was in her. Mm. It was coming out in the way she was trying to write. She couldn't write anything and I've mm. kept every piece of paper that she ever yeah. gave me. Everything yeah. she wrote for me on all those Saturdays, I've kept yeah. every single one of them. Yeah. And I can see the slow deterioration mm. in, in her, in her handwriting. It got to a point where she couldn't write anymore. Yeah. And I, I have to say it's a scary it sort is. of Look, and that's, that's the, 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 um, the horrible nature of the disease. It's it, it is the way it takes away their ability. And like you said, you know, some, some uh, motor neuron disease patients do develop a form of dementia while it's going on. But for a lot of them, their minds are sharp as it ever was. So yeah. what they're bearing witness to as they're going on is they're very aware of what's going on. So and that's the cool nature of it. And that and that's why um, – and, and it affects – I had no idea that you went through this. I mean, and it, it, it affects many more people than than people might realise. Can I tell you a little story? You, yeah. you said something to me a few years ago. Yeah. You, you might not remember this, but remember I was fighting Gary Jubilin? Yep. On the EXO? Yep. Doing EXO with him? Yep. The day I jumped in the room, Gary, yep. was the day my mother went into into the hospital for, and she was dead five days oh later. Oh my god! Um, and I should never have gone into that night with no with Jubes. No, but no. I thought you know, and it's funny thing you know. I'll tell you a funny story. Mm. My mother hated me fighting, hated yep. me boxing. Yeah, hates it. Yeah, because my dad was a fighter. She yep. absolutely hates it. Yeah, and I used to not tell her. Yeah, I fight it once or twice a year. Yeah, and I just wouldn't say nothing. Yeah, and. Uh, and it's funny that night when she, when I was mm. going into yeah. the jumping, in, I thought, shit, I, I really shouldn't be here because um, mum's mm. always not want me to jump in the ring. Yeah, and uh, mm. and uh, it's and I'll never forget it. Never ever forget that day. Mm. I'll never forget the day when. And by the way, Gary gave me a stand and eight. Yeah, um, I cop one off him. Yeah, um, well, mate, look, uh, you know that. And that's and, a and and, and it, it's. I think all these things are related. I don't care. Mm. I mean, your brother was a fighter. I don't yeah. care what. With the other yeah. aren't. It doesn't yeah. matter. I just yeah. feel as though we're getting taught a lesson here. Yeah. Yep. You know, like there's a lesson in all of this stuff, you know, mm. look after ourselves and be aware of the people we affect in our lives. And Yeah, I, it gives you an enormous amount of perspective. I mean, for me, you know, I look at, um, well, you know, my life outside of my brothers and ha having this affect me the way it's affected me. How do I look at life now? And, uh, and, and to me it's – you know, for the people that you love, be kind. Yeah. You know, it costs nothing and it makes a difference to them. Um, and, and I've been very prolific in in knocking off things over the past sort of 15 years and uh, setting goals and I've been very driven that way. Um, and, and having this happen uh, just as – given me perspective on what's important, you know, um, and not my family's always been the most important thing, but even more so now than, than ever before. It, it makes you realize that, you know, for me, 
there are five things and the rest of it's fluff. You know, I came in as a, as a son and I'm a brother and I'm a friend. Um, I'm a husband and I'm a father. Now, beyond those five things, it's all shit. Mm. It, it, it really is. Mm. If I, and I'll let myself down in those relationships at different stages, but as long as I'm aware that I'm, because it does matter it, that, that you're trying and that, and that you are trying to be the best person you can for those people, it does matter. Because when we go, uh, and, and I can see it in Aaron's eyes now, um, what matters is the effect you've had on people and, and the love that in the energy that you've had and you've passed on. So, you know, it's given us all perspective. How's he dealing with it? Yeah, look, it's, 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 you know, he has his moments, you know, and he's, you know, broke my heart the other day when he, he broke down and because he can't talk properly and can't get his words out. But the, it was the level of fear for his children, you mm. know, and that they need to be looked after and um, have get some sort of financial uh, situation where that their education is looked after, that their well-being is looked after. I mean, they're little boys, you know, they're... And they'll they'll be fatherless, um, and, and that for him is what where his great fear lies at the moment. He said to me the other day, he made me very proud, and and I'm not sure I could have been like that. But he said, he goes, I don't feel sorry for myself. He goes, this is it, and is what it is. Um, he said, but for my children, uh, that that's all that matters. So, you know. I think that there there must be some point if you're in that situation like your mother, like Aaron Aaron is, that there's an acceptance that falls over you and you go, okay, this is what's coming. And death comes for all of us. Um, but he's got a limited time here now. So he's, uh, you know, I can see him thinking about what's important and, and how he, how he wants to make sure that he's that he doesn't hurt anyone, that he doesn't um, that he can understand that it's hard for everyone else around him as well. Uh, how do they do with the kids? What do the kids think? Well, the the, the, the nine year old, um, he just knows his dad's unwell mm -hmm. and and uh, can't communicate very well. Um, be very careful about how they unload the information for, to kids like that because they don't need to know, mm -hmm. you know. What will happen will happen and he'll deal with it in the moment. The two-year-old and the one-year-old, uh, you know, they're just the – they just love their old man, you know. Mm. They're, they're at that innocent point. joy. Yeah, innocent joy. They don't know. They've got no idea. Mm. Uh, the two-year-old, um, Aaron communicates with him the best way he can and, and it usually is at the moment it's just hugging him and kissing him and cuddling him and laughing with him, playing with him. Um, same with the one-year-old. So – they'll you know, they'll deal with it and for us what's important is is that they are now my kids as well you know and, yeah. and they will be looked after and and I will treat them like they're my children um and love them that way and, and make sure that they are looked after and given the opportunities that that they can be afforded but um and, and make sure that you know there's they'll remember him the way we all did and, yeah. and they'll get to see things as they grow older that they won't remember that will be before he was they were born but they will all be pieces that we give these kids to, so that they've got particularly the two youngest kids that they understand who he was you'll you know? fill in the gaps we'll fill in the gaps for them and we'll make sure that they're aware of just just who their dad was um and, and that and for him that's you know that's that's a really important piece to this because that's what he's afraid of. Are your parents still alive? Yeah, they are. Yeah. And look, I, must be tough for them. Yeah, look, I'm like my. Yeah, I, I, look, to bear witness to what's going on with them uh, is very confronting, because they're in a situation where we all know what's happening, um, and that that's their little boy. He he, he was the youngest, um, and particularly my father at the moment. He's aged. 10 years and two weeks, you know, he's, he's really broken. Um, my mother is, you know, we, and look, we, we talk every day, every, all of us talk every day uh, and we're all there for each other, but it's, it's hard for us to watch them. You know, I think it's, and, and it's hard for Aaron because he knows what they're going through. So um, 
But you know what we try and do, mate? Look, we I try and make him laugh. You know, like mm, any day. That's what I did for mum, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Try and give him a laugh. Give me things to look forward to and I'll do a really big fundraiser in December and I'll lean on everyone. I've got enormous reach so I'll use all that. What's the fundraiser? Tell me about that. So we'll have a fundraiser probably in December um, and I'll make contact with the people I need to, you know, I'll, I'll get people from the acting community, um, sport community, um, you know, business people all together so that we're in a situation with, with an auction that we can raise um, a significant amount of money. I'll have Dominic Rowe up there talking um, and bring some real awareness in and around what needs to happen so that this this doesn't happen to other families. Uh, and at the moment, a long way from, you know, there's some trials going on that Aaron will participate in, but they're a long way from, well, you know, they're a fair way away from from how, what I understand, to, to finding out how we we can stop this. Um, and so, you know, the fundraiser will be about that, um, bringing awareness. All the stuff that I do over the coming months um, will, will be to as an, an advocacy to to shed light on this and, to, and have people understand um, just how a horrible and insipid disease it is, but also that the people who are working towards curing it are legitimate heroes. They Because they have born witness to, to what's going on around their with the patients that they that, that they see and, and the things that they have the families the, the broken family the families the fear that the, the in, in the patients and and the way eventually it takes them these people are heroes because they make it their life's work to find how, how do we unlock this and sometimes fruitless Ruthless. Well, so far, so, so far, like yeah. they, they're just finding nothing. I mean, they don't no. have an answer. No, look, there's evidence to suggest certain things. There's evidence to suggest that uh, there, there is a five percent of it is familial, so um, uh, around that percentage, so that is passed on. Uh, and then there's this sporadic form, and then they do research into what may. So there's there's clusters of it. So there's clusters in the Riverina. Uh, they're thinking there might be some sort of correlation between the algal blooms and the lakes or the the water systems there. There's a disproportionate amount of elite athletes who get it, uh, whether that's to do with strenuous exercise or or taking hits in the head. Um, you know, I don't know. Aaron, Aaron probably fell into a few categories where, you know, there was evidence to suggest something might have happened. Uh, you know, elite boxing, training hard. He was also a greenkeeper. There's there's evidence to suggest pesticides and all sorts of things. So, but they can't put their finger on anything, Mark, and say this is what causes it and that's the great mystery. So, you know, uh, and frustrating when you look at the technological advances that we have made and, and where the world sits on that level, uh, you're sending guys to space, uh, you know, in uh, as recreation, um, then it's it's baffling and it baffled the doctors why they can't unlock this thing. So well, we've got a cure. We, we got a, a vaccine for COVID in six months because yeah. the whole world was suffering. Yeah, I mean, you wonder. I often wonder myself during that period. You know, mm. Why didn't we just put the same effort into things like motor neuron disease or other? There are no, other things. That's as very well. true. And, and look, I think it gets a lot of it gets wrapped up in, in bureaucracy and politics, politics, and, and where the money's going to go. And if I put the money over here, does that secure more votes? And I think that's that's the way the world is. So, you know, but the more people that that have a, a a public forum and and have a a uh, something of uh, some currency to get it out there, then that needs to happen. Um, and the more people like you who yeah. bring this awareness. Yeah. Um. When I went to meet the uh, went to the Brain and Mind Center with my mother, the neurologist there said um, an interesting fact is that um, the Irish have a high propensity. One person per day gets diagnosed with motor neuron disease yeah, in Ireland. Okay. And um, it, there is a genetic mutation which mm -hmm. you can get tested for, and uh, but that genetic genetic mutation might not actually ever express itself. My mother's eighty five mm. when she got it. Yeah. Um, but there are things that needs to cross over the mm. genetic mutation to express itself. Yep. And uh, the three things that they told me was one, severe alcoholism, which in Ireland's a problem. Yeah. Uh, and that can often be the thing that crosses over. Yep. Two, exposure to chemicals mm -hmm. in your life. But the third one, which is a really interesting one, which is sort of quite interesting, especially in, mm. especially at the moment, is that severe respiratory disease like glandular mm. fever. And as my mother had a severe respiratory uh, disease two years before she got it. Mm. 
She's got this flu and it turned her chest infection. Got, she got really, really sick anyway. Yeah. But what's interesting now, we've got COVID, which yep. is a severe respiratory it is, disease. Yeah. And, you know, like, uh, you know, we have a very big Irish population mm-hmm. or genetically in Australia. Yep. As they do in the States. But yep. uh, it's a, it's actually a, probably a, a bigger issue than governments give it credit mm. and uh, probably should be actually addressing because at the end of the day, it costs, mm. costs the health system a lot. Yeah. It to does. to deal with this, it does because you know, there's it's carers so and there's all sorts is, of things, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know you would think that to yourself that maybe at some stage somebody can put a case to the government to say maybe we should be allocating you should be allocating mm. more money to this yep. than you currently are, yep. because it has a potential to be a lot broader. There's so many people I hear about with mm. who have been now touched by motor neurons. No, like way more than I remember. Ever. Me too. Yeah. Just, all I, of a sudden, maybe yeah. the last ten years. I agree, totally agree, and and that's the. That's the concerning thing. It's touching yeah. more people now than it seems to ever have seemed to. So, uh, you know, th- th- that is a concern. And, and like you said then, that there's a confluence of things. If there are evidence to suggest certain things may be causing that, then um, y- you don't want this to be m- more widespread than it is because it's just – it is that it, it is a, a big strain financially on – on an economy, you know, because there are things that need to be in place because these patients end up uh, invalid, yeah. you know. So it, it's it, there's a lot of infrastructure and, and care that needs to go on around um, while the disease deteriorates. Especially when it gets towards the, the latter the stages because they can't do anything for it. They can't control no, no, the, the, the bowel or anything like no. that. And, uh, and it puts enormous strain on the family. Yeah. Uh, like my dad... And you should be aware mm. of this, but my dad, I didn't realise, but mm. he got so run down mm. looking after mum. Yeah. Um, only now I can see because he's really well now because yeah. he's recovered from it. But you see it every, you know, just a little bit each day, mm. each week, they like get a little bit more run down, a little bit more run down, stressed out obviously, very yeah. anxious about the whole event, sad for yeah. their potential loss and then the loss. Um, you've got to be careful within your own family. Um, yeah. Just watch this because yeah, yeah, no, it's, you see it it's happen in front right? of you but you don't realise the progression from day one to day 50. No, it, and then that's the thing. It's you, and you Including know, you because I, no. I can tell you looked at me, mm. as I said, you look mm. a little bit beat. I am beaten, mate. Yeah. You know, like I'm, I'm struggling. I had a breakdown and look, I've been, you know, I've sort of never run away from anything. So um, when – Shit hits the fan in families as it does. Then, then I've, I've always uh, I haven't made conscious decisions to do it, but I've just sort of stepped into the fold. To, you one of the older brothers, yeah. Um, to 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 take care of things and to to be there as a you know a, a level of support. But uh, I had a moment on Saturday, uh, Sunday morning, um, you know, where it just got on top of me, and 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 I probably needed to purge myself and and get it out but it's because it is so hard um just knowing the outcome but also watching the deterioration and also like i said the fear uh, that that is surrounding the patient the whole time and you can't help him i can't do anything all i can do is is make him smile and like i said give him things to look forward to and and guarantee him that that his children um i'll uh, make every effort to make sure that, that they're they're looked after in a financial sense, but also um, emotionally, and, and and that I'll bring them in as as my own, and so will all my siblings. Um, That's interesting you should say because it, it's a lesson in that for us, I think, too, is that if you hadn't been a close family, mm. it's harder for the person who has the affliction to believe I'm sure it. Sure, it is. I'm sure it is. If no. if all of us, but if you say it to me, and I've you know, I've always known you've been my brother and you're close, and yep. and your sisters yep. and everybody else, I would believe it. I'd have the confidence. Yep. Uh, you know, like because because but what, one of the things that struck me after my mother passed away was, I never I never thought about it during the period, but it struck me a couple of years later. But I thought to myself, I wonder what it's like at two o'clock in the morning when she wakes up, mm. and she's laying there in bed on her own, no. and dad's asleep. Yep. Just be in your case, your brother. Yep. He may well be in spirits when he sees you guys. And yep. keep you up, but what? I guess we've got to think about the moments when they wake up at two in the morning. Yep, and, and they can't sleep. A lot sleep. of those. A lot and, of those. Yeah, and it's an, a scary, but mm. also then you're thinking about, well, how are my kids going? He's in his case, his kids going to get looked after. It's really important, I, I guess, yeah. 
they feel like there's a village around them. There's yeah, kind they of support. do. And I, you said something that, that, that resonates there. We're, we're lucky that um, we are so close, you know, um, and, and it's not been without its problems within the family at different stages because that's families, but we are all remarkably close. So for him, uh, he would feel that. Um, and, and we're all galvanised and, and to a degree, and you would have felt this yourself, it's, it's people are empathetic only to the degree that, that they're allowed to be in the sense that if it's not happening to them uh, and their family, it's, yes, they're sorry, but then, you know, like, oh, I'm sorry, that's terrible and now I'm just going to go buy the paper. I know that, that's fine. That's, that's life. Everyone uh, is a party that at different stages when you hear bad news of other people, even so when it's people that you know. Um, so the person it's happening to is my brother. It's not happening to me but the, but the fallout from it is happening t- to us uh, collectively, my, the immediate family. And it's hard for some people to get their head around that, um, even, you know, the, the, the peripheral type of family and uh, they're not experiencing the same level of anxiety or desperation th- to, to get this out or, or the, the great sadness that we are. Um, and so, you know, as a family coming together um, is really, really important. You know, we do things that we get to see each other all the time and that we're with Aaron and, you know, he gets to see all that type of um, love and comfort and because honestly there's not much else you can do, Mark, Mm. you know, um, and inevitably we all die alone uh, and that's just, you know, that that, that's the fact of life but it's it's difficult to watch, uh, difficult to watch knowing where this is headed um, and how, how it sort of unfolds. And so in between that, like I, I said before, it's, it's about giving him things to look forward to and, um, and giving him reassurances that, that will bring light upon this and, and then that will every endeavor to, to help with his children and, and the disease so that this happens to as few people as a as it possibly can. Is he a Canelo fan, fan, by the way? We'll, 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 we'll all be on Triple G, mate. So uh, we we'll, we'll love both of them. So, yeah. um, but, but he's a Triple G fan? Yeah, yeah. I think he's – we're all sort of in Triple G's corner for this one. I don't think he's going to win. But, um, look, it'll be a good fight, you know. Um, the, the last two fights were really, really good and really, really close. And, look, we're – you know, we've got – we're staying at the Venetian and, you know, we'll do some pool parties and we'll – yeah, we'll have a good time. Is mate. he walking around? Okay, is he, yeah, no, he's he not on a walk. frame or anything. Like no, no. At the moment, he's walking. You know, like he's um, he's, he's having some trouble with his stability, but he's he's walking. Um, so you know, we wanted to get this done. That'd be cool. Yeah, oh, be great. Like, who's going that, in the family? Ah, uh, so it'll be my older brother, myself. Uh, my uh, my sister's not going to go, um, and then my other brother, who's uh, two years older than Aaron. Then Aaron. That's Adam, is it? Yeah, Adam, yep. and and then there's. Um, a couple of his mates um, uh, that he went to school with, so they'll they'll come along, um, and we'll meet a couple of guys who are already in America. Uh, they'll they'll meet us in LA, so we're going to do a road trip from LA to Vegas. I'll drive the you know oh, yeah, through the desert. Yeah, yeah, we'll do all that, mate. And yeah, Death big, Valley. Yeah, yeah, we have a big dinner on Wednesday night. I've got a couple of actor mates there. I'll, I'll bring in and ring in and uh, in Vegas, you mean, or in LA? In LA, LA and yeah. then we'll drive there to to Vegas. So yeah, look, everyone's. Has really, he done this before? Uh, oh, he he did a lot of travel. Yeah, he's done a lot of travel with uh, with Adam. You know, they they um, you know they they two years apart, so they're best best mates. Um, and, and Ads is struggling. He's he's really struggling. But um, yeah, they they travelled all through America. Adam lived in New York for five years, so Aaron was always over there. And they'd go to Miami. They'd go to. They, look, mate, they looked like they were rock star existence at that point, you know, doing what they were doing. So they had a great time. Uh, I've seen photos and I, I, I wasn't there for any of that. But, um, yeah, there's there's some pretty <laughs> pretty harrowing stories. But, you know, we're all older now and, and, and as is – he don't – but he won't drink. He won't – you know, he's he's just there for a good time, my older brother. Um, he's very sensible and wise and – we're, we're there just to enjoy each other's company and laugh, you know, like yeah, you really totally. just have a good laugh, mate, and uh, remember and, and make new memories, you know, like that's 
that's what it's all about. And, um, you know, it, the level of excitement that everyone's got at the moment is is palpable, you know, like every time we talk about it and we see each other, it's something we're really looking forward to. And and we'll just keep doing those things, mate, on smaller yeah. scales. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you shouldn't stop no. because, because – He's that, alive, mate. He, yeah. He's alive. And, yeah. he's, he's and his brain's a, working. Still got a sense of humour like he, he said <laughs> – He's got a sense of humour. He said, um, I'm going to try and get an upgrade to, you know, when we're flying over to business class. And I said, why are you going to do that? And he said, I'll just, you know, talk. And then they can see how much, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm in a bit of trouble here. You know, can I get comfortable? And um, But he's, you know, he's had, up, like he's a, he's got that about him. He's a, he's a rascal. So he's, he told me I've been upgraded three times, mate. There's nothing wrong with me at all. You know, so, he goes. so that makes me laugh. I think, you know, he's got a sense of humour and he's, um, yeah, that, that that makes me feel good. Who are you guys travelling with? You're on a, we're, on a we're just on Delta, mate. We were Delta Airlines, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just Delta and, you know, we're all in a row together and um, we're together, mate. Yeah. You know, like the, it, it doesn't matter. We could be in a, we could be in a, you know, down down in the in the, in the the luggage compartment but we're, we're all together and that's, you know, that's, Something we're really, really looking forward to, you know. So, and and you you've got to go fund me, um. and and that you know I'll be very clear on that. That is not for Aaron, you know. Aaron Aaron is okay. Mm. Um, this is for uh, will be the money that we raise towards research and, and awareness, and then uh, we'll go into trust, which we're setting up now. The the trust accounts for the kids, um, and so that they are given, you know, they they they're little little boys that they're given. Uh, and they'll have, you know, one income with their with their their mother, um, and she's got to juggle those three children, and it's it'll be hard. Um, so, whatever we can raise, um, we'll, we'll ensure that those boys have the same opportunities to education that they would have had had Aaron been with them. Um, and, and look, the Aaron's been on the waterfront for twenty years. He's a wharfie, and those guys, what they've done for him. Um, is extraordinary. They all, uh, they just gifted him uh, a year's wage. Everyone gave him a sickie um, and that happened <coughs> overnight. Amazing. Um, the, you know, the solidarity that those guys have is, is incredible and I've sat with uh, Keto who's high up in the union um, and had these very uncomfortable situ- uh, conversations in the company of my brother and he just said, here we looked after that, that he is going to be looked after. He's one of us, and uh, and and so, like I said, the GoFundMe page is for is for the children, is for for, for awareness and for research, um, and, and to bring light onto onto this disease. And for as long as I'm drawing breath, I'll be actively involved in anything that I'm asked to do about motor neuron disease, and uh, and that's important to me. I mean, I've had. I've been very vocal about my mental health issues over the years. That's something that I'm passionate about because there are too many people that fall through the cracks um, and having what we're going through now, this will be another a pursuit that that you feel passionately about because it, we're experiencing in real time what the outcomes are and, and the effects uh, and – that there's got to be, and there is, there's a cure out there somewhere and we have to find it. Oh, I, it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, I'm speaking to you about this today. Um, this Thursday mm. I get my MND genetic results. Right. So, but they told me that I've got to go see a counsellor first. Yeah, right. And I thought, shit. Yeah. I hope that doesn't mean I got the mutation. Yep. But then I thought, well, if I got it, I got it. Like I'd yep. rather know. Yep. A lot of people struggle with actually should they go and get the test for it. Yep. Um, and uh, it takes 12 weeks. I, I had the yep. test 12 weeks ago. Yep. Um, well, uh, that's daunting. You know, that that is that is daunting. Yeah. I thought, shit, that's amazing. Mm. I'm seeing Maddie this week mm. and I'm getting my results on Thursday. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and it's it's – I take the view that, um, the, the, by the way, the tests are very expensive. And yep. A normal, an ordinary person, an average person, can't would not be able to afford it. Yep. And I'm blessed; I can't afford it. Yep. But at the same time, I think it's wrong that they can't. That only someone like me can afford it. Yeah. Because yeah. there's, you know, 
Yeah. Everybody should be able to get this test. Yeah. Um, and, yep. uh, and, and I had to go to a private organisation to get it done. Yeah. You can't just walk down the road at St Vincent's and get it done. Yeah. Um, you know, I tried to do that during the um, lockdowns and yep. uh, the COVID. I, I couldn't even get anyone to answer a phone down there at yeah, the yeah. Um, various places down yep. at St Vincent's. And uh, but in the end I had a guy, and funny, funny I've had a guy on my podcast who's yeah. got a, a scientific background who runs his business that does these mm. tests for dementia and all sorts of things. Yep. But I got him, him to, to organise yep. it for me. But. Do you think that um, now you know what you know? Do you think that a, an important that? part of this should be that everybody should, whoever most, wants to get tested should be able to get tested for an affordable definitely. price? Look, I, I think that that's part of bringing this into the public sphere that uh, and to make sure that there are concessions made with 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 government funding so that that happens. You know what I mean? That 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 is a, a part of um, part of the mechanism. Uh, of fighting this is is to get as many people tested who who th- you know are in danger of mm. passing it on or or having having it passed on to them um because the quicker that they can look the the, the unfortunate thing with the disease is that Aaron's probably had this between 2 and 5 years yeah that's and, and it only sh- you only start to show symptoms when the neurons cross that threshold when there's more sick neurons than there are healthy neurons uh, but at that point, it's you know it's too but, late. Yeah, but if they can, perhaps there's something in that you know knowing the people who are genetically predisposed to getting it that, that there's tests or something that they could do to provide some some sort of evidence or or pathway into finding something that eliminates the you know the the cause or eliminates the possibility of them actually then developing it or at least extending the time exactly that you do have it. Yes. Like from, say, three years or yeah. six months to a longer period. Yep. So at least you can get your shit together. Exactly. And get your life organised. In your yep. case and your brother's, if you had known this some time ago, he might have been, at, been in a position to put money in a trust and, you know. Yes, exactly. And, and talk to his kids and talk to his wife and yep. his partner and talk yep. to his family and sort of build it up into yep. something much more palatable. Yep. Manageable. Yep. Yep. That, that sort of gave him confidence that there is a future. Yeah. For everybody around me. Yeah. You're right. Like. At the end of the day, I took the view: if I like, if I find out I've I've got a you know a, a genetic predisposition for it, it is what it is. Because we're gonna we're all gonna go for something, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it allows me to manage things, yeah, to do things, yeah. And, and I might have a different perspective on my life too. I might yeah, say, yeah. Oh, "Hang on a minute, exactly." I might go and join Maddie and uh, the boys over Come in to Las Vegas. Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> so if I ring you up and say, "Man, I'm booking a ticket to Vegas," yeah, 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 you know yeah, why? You know what's happening? You yeah. know what's happening? Okay, yeah, so yeah. but like you know, I'm serious though because I think I think, yeah. So some people probably wouldn't don't like to know about these things, but mm. I think that this should be available for those people who do want to know about it. Yeah, I and governments need to do something about it. Yep, and we need to, we need to build up awareness, particularly yep. if you do have these backgrounds, these, these genetic yep. Irish backgrounds and yep. stuff like that. If it yep. or Celtic backgrounds, it's yep. it's a it's a thing. Yeah, yeah, you know? and that's the thing that that they are. Like I said, there's evidence to suggest these things, so that's where the time and the money needs to be poured into, yeah. so that uh, whatever. You know, wherever the, the the hounds are leading them on on on, okay, this is a thing, then that's where there needs to be a you know an exacerbated type of um, research and uh, you, you know awareness. I think that that's important for that's really important to, to get a hold of this thing. You and know? I think it's going to be individuals like you, maybe me and others are yep. going to start to – we all got to push these things together. And I'm, yep. I'm, by the way, I'd love to come to the, the function that you're holding yeah. in December if you don't yep. mind and of I'll course, bring some people yeah, with yeah. me. But can I ask a question? Yeah. Like it's a, maybe it's a quite a personal yep. question though. How do you feel? I'm just sad, mate. Just really sad. Mm. Um, sad for him. For his kids, um, you know, watching him deal with this at the moment is um, it's just fucking heartbreaking. You know, it just that's a you know, level of sadness I've never felt. You know, and um, yeah, it's uh, you know, but again, um, we in great sadness. Also, there are there are moments of elevated joy because you know what's in the future so you enjoy things a little bit more with him and don't take things for granted um and you cherish things that sometimes you might not have and like i said the perspective you get in life 
because of this, I hopefully changes me for the better. If you ask how I feel, I want to come out of this better person, better son, better brother, better friend, better husband and a better father. You know, that, that, that for me is really important, really important. Um, and, and, and to love him as much as I can while he's here and, and let him know that. Um, but it's hard, mate. You know, it's, it's tough. We're struggling and this, and we're not alone, you know. this You went through this um, and there are, there are families going through this every day. Um, Dom, the doctor, you know, said that he, he has three people a week that come into his office and he has to tell them this. He said, if you're in my office, it's not a good day. Mm. There is nothing good about this. Um, so we got to find, uh, his words, we have to find a solution. Uh, and, and that's incumbent on everyone um, who's been affected by this, th th you know, to, to, to do what they can. Um, and everyone who's been affected by this um, will do that because they'll understand the, 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 the horrible um, show that goes with it. It's a horror show. Yeah. It is a horror show. Yep. Manny, um, I wish your brother all the best. I, I, I particularly wish his family, his immediate family, his kids, yep. um, every, every assistance that they can possibly get. And if there's anything I can help for you or your brother or your family, um, just let me know, Mum. I appreciate a hundred percent, mate. And you know, I've known you for well over ten years. I think the first time I met you, mate, was I was doing the final winter. Yeah, you know, that was sixteen years ago, and um, I, I greatly appreciate your time, mate, and and sharing your story with me. I, I didn't know, um, so there's a solidarity between you and I, mate, that that won't get broken because of what we uh, bear witness to. So, uh, thank you, mate, and, and like I said, over the next. However long, I'll, I'll do what I can to bring awareness and, and raise money. We'll, we'll put something about the GoFundMe page and I'll definitely yeah. be at the function. Yeah. And uh, all my heartfelt love for your brother. Thank you, buddy. Please I, tell him. I appreciate that. Thanks, mate.